Wow. It's not using any of the efficiency cores. Six of them. That's crazy. In the last two Mac review videos, I basically discovered that not all DAWs can fully utilize all the cores in an Apple Silicon chip. And as a result, a newer chip doesn't necessarily give you better performance depending on which DAW you use. Over here, I have Apple's newest M3 Pro MacBook Pro. And this time, by popular request, I'm going to test seven DAWs on it to see how well they utilize the cores in the chip. Then I'll compare to my 10 core M2 Pro Mac and my 10 core M1 Pro Mac to show the performance differences across seven DAWs. My goal is to provide you with accurate information so we can make an informed decision on which Mac best suits your needs. And so in the last two weeks, I tested and retested all seven DAWs on all three Macs multiple times to ensure that all the results were repeatable and not just one-off occurrences. The M3 MacBook Pro I bought has the 11 core M3 Pro, 18 gig of RAM and 512 gig of SSD. Out of the 11 cores in the chip, five of them are performance cores and six of them efficiency. It's quite interesting that Apple has been replacing more and more performance cores with efficiency ones for the Pro chips since the M2 line. With the 10 core M1 Pro, you get eight performance cores and two efficiency cores. With the 10 core M2 Pro, you get only six performance cores, but four efficiency cores. And now with the 11 core M3 Pro, you get six efficiency cores, but only five performance cores. This change in performance core to efficiency core ratio does make a noticeable difference in real life audio processing scenarios. And that brings us to the testing. To assess a DAW's multi-core utilization, I first put a mono guitar DI on a track. Then I put an Apple Silicon native plugin, Archetype Nolly on the track, set it to high oversampling so it would be more taxing on a CPU. And then I duplicated the track with the plugin as many times as possible until I heard crackling in the audio or saw a CPU overload pop up when I tried to play all the tracks uh, back at the same time. I would then delete one track, hit play to see if the DAW could play back smoothly. If so, I would note down the track count. If not, I would keep deleting tracks until the DAW could play back smoothly and then note down the track count. So these track counts represent the maximum CPU power you can get with a specific DAW on a specific chip with this specific plugin. To take thermals into account, I did run each test for about half an hour in a room that's about 23 degrees Celsius or 73 degrees Fahrenheit before I wrote down the results. All DAWs were also set to 1024 buffer size, which is suitable for mixing and mastering. And the DAW projects were all in 44.1 kilohertz and set to 84 bit summing when the option was available. Now I want to explain my testing methodology a bit here so you understand why I did the test this way in this video and in the last two Mac videos. And also why the test results are helpful in real life. In the last two years, I've been testing uh, Apple Silicon Macs for audio processing. I've learned that testing DAW performance on these chips really comes down to multi-core utilization. Now, obviously no one will duplicate the same track so many times in a real mixing session, but you probably have many tracks and those tracks will probably have all kinds of plugins on them. In a typical mixing session like that, you are basically relying on the multi-core performance your DAW can get out of the chip. And that's what I'm simulating here with my test setup. It doesn't really matter that I'm duplicating an amps many times. What matters here is that we can see how each DAW uses the cores in the CPU and how much of a difference the M1 Pro, M2 Pro, and M3 Pro chips have compared to each other. Let's start with Reaper. And here's a screenshot of the audio configurations I used for the test. I was able to play back 91 tracks with the 10 core version of both the M1 Pro and M2 Pro before the audio started to crackle. With the 11 core M3 Pro chip, Reaper could handle 105 tracks, which is 14 tracks more. If we look at a CPU monitor here, you can see that Reaper is able to utilize all the cores, both performance and efficiency to the absolute limit. With M3 Pro having one extra core, Reaper was able to give you more performance as one would expect. Because of this, I would consider Reaper to be fully optimized for all these chips. And this means that if your main DAW is Reaper, you can expect more performance if you get a chip with more cores. I want to remind you that the exact track count here means nothing because with a different plugin, you could have way more or way less tracks. The numbers are here to show the differences on how well these seven DAWs utilize each CPU. 
If you enjoyed the video so far, let me know by leaving a like and or leaving a comment. Uh, it would really help out the channel. Moving on to Cubase 13, and these are the audio configurations I had for the test. Cubase 13 could handle 89 tracks with M1 Pro and M2 Pro, and with M3 Pro, it could handle 104 tracks, which is 15 tracks more. Looking at the CPU monitor here, you can see that the story is the same as Reaper. Cubase 13 was able to fully utilize all the cores, though not as to the limit as Reaper did, but still, the results are very similar. I suspect it takes a bit more resources to run Cubase 13 simply because it has so many more features than Reaper, and that might be why the track counts are just a little bit less than Reaper. But you can see that um, Cubase 13 is still fully optimized for Apple Silicon chips. Next up is Pro Tools Ultimate, and these are the audio configurations. On M1 Pro, Pro Tools could handle 86 tracks, but on M2 Pro, only 71. On the M3 Pro, however, it could only handle 64 tracks, which is 22 less tracks compared to Pro Tools running on M1 Pro. I'm going to duplicate this track one more time. And this is what happens. Can't even play it. So why does the third generation chip with more cores perform worse than the first generation chip? Well, the answer is in the CPU monitor. You can see that on all three chips, Pro Tools only used the uh, performance cores fully and the efficiency cores remained idle. Despite M3 having one extra core in the, uh, than the M1 Pro, if you looked at only the performance cores, M1 Pro actually has three more performance cores than the M3 Pro. And this is why Pro Tools on the 10-core M1 Pro outperforms it being on the 11-core M3 Pro. And also why Pro Tools on M3 Pro sits in the middle, since the 10-core M2 Pro has one more performance core than the M3 Pro, but two less than the M1 Pro. It feels like I'm doing something wrong here, but I double and triple checked to ensure that any settings that could get Pro Tools to use the CPU better, I had already enabled them. And this is still the best I can get. So I can only conclude that Pro Tools simply does not make full use of the efficiency cores. Let's now take a look at Logic Pro X, Apple's own doll. And here are the audio configurations. Many of you in my last videos told me to set the processing threads to the max instead of automatic. I already said in those videos or the comments that I already did that. And once again, I'm saying that here that I did that, okay? So on the M1 Pro, Logic could handle 79 tracks, but on the M2 Pro, only 67 tracks. On the M3 Pro, again, it could handle even less tracks than the first and second generation chips, at only 64 tracks. Looking at the CPU monitor on three computers, you can see that Logic only fully utilized the performance cores. Moving on to Ableton Live 11. I know that Live 12 is out in beta, but I don't have access to it, so 11 is what I tested. Here's the audio configurations I had for the test. On M1 Pro, Live 11 could handle 72 tracks, but on the M2 Pro, only 62 tracks, and on the M3 Pro, even less, at 60 tracks. Some of you pointed out that Ableton has a web page saying that for Apple Silicon chips, you should use smaller buffer sizes for lower CPU usage and larger buffer sizes for higher CPU usage. However, in my experience, Live 11 behaves exactly the same as other dolls when it comes to buffer size, latency, and CPU usage, which is that, if you set the buffer size to larger, you'll be able to do more audio processing at the expense of higher latency. If you set the buffer size to smaller, you will get lower latency at the expense of not being able to do as much audio processing. So right now I have the buffer size at 1024, which is a pretty large buffer. It will be able to play 60 tracks. <laughs> Now, if I change it to a small buffer size, like 128, and I'm going to try to play the same thing. Yeah, it's even worse. I'm more inclined to believe that Ableton did not make a mistake in the article. I think the wording is just a bit confusing. I'm honestly not sure, maybe I did something completely wrong, so please correct me in the comments if I did. Taking a look at CPU monitors, you can see that, once again, only the performance cores were being fully used by Live 11 on all three Macs. Next up is the new doll, FL Studio. I think some of you wrote to ImageLine about FL Studio not being included in my previous Mac testing videos, and the company was kind enough to send me a license to test it. 
They said absolutely no strings uh, attached. They did not even ask me to include it in this video. But of course, I read your comments and included it of my own volition. But the fact that I got a license for free did not impact my testing in any way. I'm, I'm just here reporting hard data. Here are the audio configurations I had for the test. On both M1 Pro and M2 Pro, FL Studio could only handle 61 tracks, while on the M3 Pro, it could handle 70 tracks. This is an interesting case because if you look at the CPU monitors, all the cores were being used almost to the max. Theoretically, FL Studio should be able to give us performance levels similar to uh, those from Reaper and Cubase 13, but in reality, it's far from it. Now, I did find FL Studio's workflow to be rather different than other DAWs, so just to make sure I didn't make a, mis uh, a huge mistake, I'll quickly show you how I set up the test. I first imported the MonoDI file into a track, then I assigned it to insert one in track mode. In a mixer, I added archetype Nolly as an insert. Then I right click on a track and use the clone option to duplicate the many copies of the track. Unless I did something wrong here, I don't know why FL Studio is underperforming compared to Reaper and Cubase despite being able to use all the cores. I thought maybe it was uh, because of all the fancy animations in FL Studio, so I tried setting animation to minimum and that didn't help. So I really don't know. But what we do know from the test result is that having more cores, be they the performance type or efficiency type, does give you a leg up in FL Studio. The last DAW I tested was Studio 1.6, and here are the audio configurations I had. You may notice that I had dropout production set to high instead of maximum. The reason is to keep the process block size the same as other DAWs, which is 1024 samples. If I set dropout production to maximum, the process block size would become 2048, and that wouldn't make a fair comparison. On M1 Pro, Studio 1 could handle 70 tracks, but on M2 Pro, only 66 tracks. On M3 Pro, it's 65 tracks. Looking at the CPU monitors, you can see that Studio One is similar to Pro Tools, Logic, and Live 11 in that it doesn't fully utilize the efficiency cores. So the chip with more performance cores, M1 Pro in this case, will give you more performance. All right, I'm going to duplicate it one more, one more time. Here we go. I'm gonna play it. Oh. Yeah, definitely cannot handle that. I did notice that something weird is happening with Studio One on the M1 Pro Mac though. It's not using one of the performance cores for some reason. I'm assuming it must be some kind of bug. So where does that leave us? Well, if your main doll is Reaper, Cubase, or FL Studio, the number of cores a chip has will directly translate to how much performance you get. It actually doesn't even matter the number of performance cores versus efficiency cores because even though the 10 core M2 Pro traded two performance cores to be efficiency cores, it offers the same performance as the 10 core M1 Pro. This means that if the kind of work you do requires mostly audio processing, like mixing, and you do it in Reaper, Cubase, or FL Studio, a Mac with the 10 core M1 Pro chip will give you the best value. Or if you think you need more cores, and if I were to extrapolate from the testing data so far, the 12 core M2 Pro should give you the same performance as the 12 core M3 Pro. I'll emphasize that this is merely my extrapolation based on empirical data, and I did not actually have the chance to test these 12 core chips personally. If your main DAW is Pro Tools, Logic Pro X, Ableton Live 11, don't know about 12, or Studio One, it's important to keep in mind that your DAW only fully utilizes the performance cores in an Apple Silicon chip, at least as of this video's publishing date. It would be a mistake to assume that the newest MacBook Pro with an 11 core M3 Pro would offer you more performance than a Mac with a 10 core M1 Pro. When choosing a Mac, you should really pay attention to how many performance cores the chip has because those are what will be powering your DAW. Here's some advice for you to consider. I know we all want to buy the newest Macs with the newest chips. I know some of you love that new matte black color, but if you want to get the most out of the money you spent, or if you want to allocate more of your money for RAM or SSD, the best Mac for you might be from the M1 line or the M2 line. For example, if you need a lot of RAM for your film scoring sound libraries, it would make much more sense to get this M1 Max Micro Pro with 64 gig of RAM and two terabyte SSD from Apple's refurbished store. 
instead of configuring 64 gig of RAM for a brand new M3 Max MacBook Pro. It's a difference of $1,400. Unless you really need that 16 core M3 Max chip as well, it would make no sense to spend that extra cash when all you need is a lot of RAM. My M1 and M2 Mac buying guy video is more relevant than ever now that more and more Apple Silicon Macs are hitting the secondhand market. You can see from this video that the M1 line can actually be even more powerful than the M3 line for audio production. It's really a great time to upgrade your Mac or jump on the Apple Silicon line. Honestly, I have been using my M1 Max MacBook Pro since launch and I've yet to feel the need to upgrade it, like at all. I work with a lot of large mixing projects and most of the time I'm only using like 50% of the CPU. It's bonkers. That's it for today. If you find this video helpful at all, please consider giving it a like. It will really help out the channel. Don't forget to subscribe if you want more content like this and I will see you next time buying guy video is more relevant than we were supposed to eat raspberries <laughs> oh no